Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Before we get into the drug of the day, as always, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Snag your free 31-page PDF. It is a study guide of the top 200 drugs. Definitely a no-brainer to go through, uh, refresh yourself with maybe some things that you that you've uh, long forgotten, or if you're uh, just getting into pharmacy school, nursing school, med school, uh, and uh, really want a, a resource to kind of help you through. Uh, your learnings throughout college, definitely go check that out. Reallifepharmacology.com, uh, free PDF, going uh, to take only your email there. So with that said, let's get into the drug of the day today, and that is duloxetine. So I have covered SNRIs previously, uh, but I wanted to dig a little bit deeper on this drug uh, specifically. Brand name of this medication is Cymbalta. Uh, I have seen... Uh, the brand name Drizalma before, and that is a uh, sprinkle type product of duloxetine. Um, but by and large, in clinical practice, you're going to see Cymbalta uh, used most often. Uh, this is an SNRI. Uh, it is also cl- technically classified as an antidepressant, anti-anxiety medication at times. Uh, mechanistically, an SNRI... Uh, we're going to inhibit serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake. So essentially increase the activities of these two neurotransmitters in the brain. And that's going to uh, potentially help uh, treat depression, help treat anxiety, help treat various pain syndromes. And interestingly, uh, off-label... Uh, Stress incontinence um, can also uh, be a potential use for this medication. Now, in clinical practice, where do I see it used the most? Uh, It's going to be depression and pain syndromes uh, by far, Uh, sometimes anxiety on occasion. With depression and anxiety, it is important to note uh, that it's going to take a few weeks for this medication to really kind of ramp up and start working. So really important patient education point so they don't get uh, impatient and quit the medication too early after a few days, for example. Uh, if they start taking it and they don't, they're not feeling any better, uh, we got to make sure that we've educated them on that point that it's going to take a little while. Let's talk about dosing a little bit. Um, 30 milligrams is the usual starting dose. Um, that I've seen utilized once a day. And from there, we generally titrate or go up to 60 milligrams kind of as needed. Now, we can go up to 90 and 100, a maximum of 120 milligrams per day. I will say most of the evidence, most of the literature, or maybe I should say lack thereof, uh, we don't have a lot of evidence supporting those higher doses in being more efficacious for various disease states, whether it's, you know, pain syndrome like fibromyalgia or neuropathy or osteoarthritis. We don't have a ton of evidence indicating that those higher dosages are beneficial. But of course, as with many drugs, side effects are dose dependent. So as you go up to those higher doses, you're more and more likely uh, to potentially run into uh, adverse effects. One more thing on the the dosage form front, Uh, there is a 20 milligram dose. Uh, I do see it occasionally. I'm not a huge fan of of doing the the twice a day 20 milligrams uh, if we don't need it. Um, It might be an option uh, for tapering down. Uh, It might be an option if patients report pain at specific times of the day or they feel like maybe the medication is wearing off a little bit. That might be a situation where we go to that twice daily uh, dosing regimen. Uh, But again, I I generally tend to recommend staying with the once daily, you know, unless there's a a good reason or significant reason um, not to to do it once daily. Uh, As you get to higher doses, then I might encourage um, splitting that up a little bit because, as I'll talk about in adverse effects, GI upset can happen a little bit. Um, and we, if we give 
all that dose if we're bumping up to 90 or 120 if we give all that at once you know we may have a little bit more likelihood of of adverse effects there so again kind of uh, you know a little bit of a gray area as far as you know how to dose and and that sort of thing um, but by and large if we're at 30 or 60 milligrams or lower I'm generally going to be in the boat of trying to do once daily if we can. All right, let's talk about those adverse effects. Uh, I mentioned uh, or hinted at GI upset. That's definitely something I have seen in practice. Uh, I believe the percentages are in the ballpark of uh, 10 to 20%, so nausea, looking out for things like that. Uh, CNS changes can happen, um, sedation, uh, potentially insomnia in some patients, uh, dizziness, uh, maybe confusion in, in rare rare cases. Increase in blood pressure, uh, sexual dysfunction, so similar to the SSRIs, duloxetine can cause uh, sexual dysfunction. That is something you might want to um, ask about. Uh, similar to uh, SSRIs, we can have discontinuation syndrome, so basically withdrawal symptoms from the medication if we stop it too quickly. So Always a good idea to try to taper your SSRIs and your SNRIs like uh, duloxetine in this situation. If we taper too quickly, what you might run into is uh, symptoms like anxiety, uh, GI upset, dizziness, uh, paresthesias can happen, so kind of this kind of tingling uh, sensation. Uh, interestingly, uh, several years ago, I, I had a rare case of uh, sweating. So basically, I was asked to consult on a on a possible drug induced sweating situation, and uh, we actually determined that it was likely due uh, to duloxetine. So we actually restarted the drug, the sweating stopped, and we uh, tapered down at a little slower rate. So kind of an interesting case. I wouldn't say that's incredibly common that you're going to see that, but if you note that we've just discontinued. Uh, an SNRI like duloxetine, uh, and maybe we were at a higher dose and we discontinued it quickly, uh, keep an eye out for some of those withdrawal symptoms because they can certainly happen. One question uh, that I definitely wanted to at least mention was conversions. So oftentimes you'll get providers that want to switch to SSRIs uh, to an SNRI like duloxetine. Okay, so if the patient is at a low dose, so let's say they're on sertraline 25 milligrams and, and we want to go to uh, duloxetine, what would I recommend in that situation? I would recommend just probably stopping the SSRI and, you know, next day or whatever, starting the duloxetine at the usual starting dose, maybe 30 milligram once a day dose there. As we get to higher doses, let's say you got somebody on uh, sertraline 200 milligrams a day and we want to get them over to duloxetine, that's a situation where we're probably going to do some sort of cross taper. So, you know, maybe you drop down the, the sertraline to uh, 150 or 100 milligrams as you're starting uh, the duloxetine at 30 milligrams low dose and then kind of slowly go down with the sertraline over time and start to taper up on the uh, duloxetine. So again, that's a, a situation where, you know, kind of a cross taper is going to be involved and uh, you're going to want to obviously take into account that patient experience and, and how aggressive do we want to get them up to a target dose versus, you know, the urgency of the situation. And, you know, we'd maybe want to be more on the cautious side if it, we don't feel like it's urgent uh, that we get that dosage up too quickly. So those are just kind of some things to think about um, and something that definitely comes up in clinical practice, thinking about that cross taper type situation, as well as kind of switching from one to the other, because oftentimes in um, mental health disorders, things like that, you know, and drugs sometimes don't work right away. And so we often have to switch or transition to uh, other agents there. 
All right, so let's take a quick break from our sponsor, and I'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material, like BCPS, BCACP, BCMTMS, BCGP, or NAPLEX, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. Uh, in addition to those resources, uh, we've got great books on case studies, drug interactions, real-life clinical pearls. Uh, all those links can be found at meded101.com slash store and can be beneficial for all sorts of different health care professions that deal with medications, from nurses to nurse practitioners, PAs, physicians, med students, um, Definitely, you can find a lot that's beneficial and a lot of information uh, that's directly from real-world experience, which is sometimes uh, difficult to get. So again, go support the sponsors, support this podcast, help keep it free uh, for all to benefit from. All those resources at meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All right, so finishing up with drug interactions. So knowing and understanding that duloxetine has an increase in serotonin activity, uh, that's one of the easiest and first things to think about. You're going to have additive serotonin type activity. So any SSRI, uh, TCA, MAOI, all these drugs can have additive serotonin activity and potentially increase the risk for serotonin syndrome. Other drugs, uh, I think, as some of the, the migraine medications like triptans, a uh, drug like tramadol, those can also have additive serotonergic type activity. Uh, a true contraindication, so it shouldn't use MAOIs with uh, duloxetine, uh, linazolids, another drug uh, antibiotic with MAOI type activity that you generally shouldn't use with uh, duloxetine. And then we've got SIP interactions that I definitely think you should be aware of. So duloxetine actually inhibits CYP2D6. And I've talked about this uh, with other agents as well, bupropion being a classic example. So if you want to go back and listen to bupropion, uh, I definitely talk about that a little bit more. But uh, give you a quick summary of some drugs that can have their concentrations increased when duloxetine is added or increased. So drugs that are broken down by CYP2D6, at least partially, um, clozapine, so antipsychotic, and another antipsychotic, risperidone. Uh, Propranolol is a good example of a drug that is broken down by CYP2D6. So adding duloxetine onto that could increase propranolol concentrations. Again, propranolol being a a non-selective beta blocker there. Interestingly, tamoxifen, which I believe I have covered previously, is activated. It's a prodrug, so it's activated by CYP2D6. So by giving duloxetine with tamoxifen, we could actually reduce the effectiveness of tamoxifen in breast cancer. So some important interactions to, to pay attention to there via CYP2D6. Now, Duloxetine is broken down in part or significantly by CYP1A2. So any drug that inhibits CYP1A2 could increase duloxetine concentrations and obviously be potentially more uh, more causative of adverse effects from duloxetine that I, I kind of covered previously. So drugs that inhibit CYP1A2 and can increase duloxetine concentrations. The two classic examples, uh, ciprofloxacin, antibiotic used for infection, definitely something you're going to see out there in practice. Uh, And another kind of classic cause of drug interactions is fluvoxamine. This is an SSRI, so hopefully we aren't using it together with duloxetine in the first place. We should generally avoid using SNRIs and SSRIs. Um, I will say I have seen that combination in practice, not necessarily something I uh, recommend or enjoy seeing. Um, But again, fluvoxamine and its CYP1A2 uh, inhibitory activity could increase uh, the uh, concentrations of duloxetine there, in addition to Cipro, like I mentioned. 
All right, so I think that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, Share us with friends, colleagues. Help us grow this podcast. Uh, It's free. And obviously a, a good review of pharmacology and, of course, some of those things that you actually see out there in real life. So, again, share us. Leave a rating review on iTunes, wherever you're listening. Uh, support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. Um, you can go snag your free Audible book at meded101.com slash store as well. Uh, so that's a, a good way to, to help support this podcast as well. Uh, if you got suggestions, comments, I uh, want to leave a, a complaint, concern, definitely uh, don't hesitate to reach out, mededucation101 at gmail.com, or you can track me down, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCGP, BCPS, at LinkedIn. With that, I'm going to sign off for today. Thanks again for listening. Take care and hope you have a great rest of your day.